the, uh, the theme for this afternoon is um, if you truly love me, uh, don't create me in your mind. So I didn't think up this title myself. But, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, before the rains retreat, we, we send out a, a reminder to all of the uh, monks and nuns to uh, suggest titles for these Sunday talks. And a whole list, several pages come back, and then we select the uh, titles from that. And when we think of, uh, of uh, loving somebody or being loved by someone, uh, then the, the customary way we, we think about it, or the, the sort of traditional or ordinary way we think, uh, is in terms of, um, don't ever forget me. Please don't forget me. Uh, never let me go, right? If uh, you think if somebody loves you, then they won't forget you, right? If somebody, uh, if somebody loves you, then they'll hang on to you. They'll, they'll, they'll be always there. Um, and, and yet this, uh, this title, this theme, suggests something different. Now probably most of us have had the experience that when we, we love someone or we care for someone, we're trying to do the best that we can to help them or to connect with them or be available to them, then uh, <clears throat> there can be this... Um, this uh, dynamic, this quality of, of contact between you, where no matter how hard you try, there's always a, a barrier between you. Anyone had that kind of experience? <laughs> where you're, you're trying so hard to get it right, but yet things always seem to go slightly wrong, or slightly, get slightly out of tune, or you, you can't quite um, uh, establish a, 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 a full sense of, of trust and ease. And it seems to be like the harder that you try, the more there is a division between you and the other, whether, whether it's uh, 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 parents to children or uh, uh, spouses, uh, wife and husband to each other, uh, whether it's a, to a teacher or a student, student to the teacher, teacher to the student, <laughs> that uh, we can experience this sense of, um, of separation and that we can try... Uh, all kinds of different ways, all sorts of different approaches to try and be more helpful or get closer or be, uh, say, uh, m having a, a more complete connection, either as a teacher or as a parent or as a friend or as a, uh, a partner. But yet there can still be that sense of, of uh, alienation, uh, a, a separateness there. And it can be very confusing or frustrating because we can feel like, well, I'm trying, I'm doing the best that I can. <laughs> I'm trying so hard, but yet still uh, I feel at a distance. I feel um, I can't quite get through, I can't quite connect, or, or there's something between us, or it's not, uh, there's not that kind of uh, closeness or oneness that uh, I'm looking for. And yet the more that we try, <laughs> yeah, the more uh, that we uh, experience uh, those kind of challenges, that kind of separation. Is that uh, familiar to anybody here? Yeah. Anybody, everybody, has anybody here never experienced that kind of? Okay. So um, I remember years ago, uh, when I was, uh, I think I was a teenager, seeing this painting of uh, René Magritte, Belgian surrealist painter, and it's called The Lovers. And in this, probably a few of you are familiar with this painting. But in this painting, you have uh, there's two lovers, uh, a woman and a man, and uh, and they're kind of in a, in a classical embrace with each other, kissing. But yet each one has got a white bag over their head, like two separate white bags. So their faces are pressed up against each other, but they're both inside their own bag. And I remember seeing that and, th and thinking, yes, <laughs> that's what it's like. Uh, but it can be very difficult because uh, and confusing because. No matter how t how hard you try to uh, to uh, sort of get the bag off <laughs> and really connect with others and not have any kind of uh, of division, and whether it's between parents and children or, or brothers and sisters, uh, lovers or teachers and students or whatever it might be, um, still we can find that that barrier that um, uh, that disconnect. Uh, many years ago. Um, back in the, the uh, early days of Chithas Monastery, one of the, the, the nuns was about to go and visit her family. 
And she had a particularly sort of tense and difficult relationship with, with her parents. They were extremely unhappy about her being a nun, having shaved her head and, and wearing robes. They were sort of staunch, uh, staunch Christian of, uh, traditionalist family. And uh, so I've got this <laughs> collapsing microphone problem again. <laughs> They were a staunch Christian family, and um, they uh, were, were very unhappy about their daughter, A, becoming a Buddhist, and then and B, shaving her head and, uh, and uh, going over into this weird religion. But it, they were a, a, um, a, a close family, and so the, this one of the sisters was, was very concerned, very um, uh, eager to try and get things right between her and her parents. And... Um, and you know, she suffered a lot trying to, to uh, sort of communicate with them or explain Buddhism or explain her, her interest and her faith and her commitment. And uh, so this came up at, uh, at tea time one day at Chithurst. And, uh, and uh, so Ajahn Sumedho was you know, answering questions as he usually would at tea time. And she said, um, you know, what's, what's the best thing that you can do for your parents or how can you you uh, help your parents in the in the best way. If they don't, if they don't uh, have any interest in dhamma, they're not sort of supportive. You know, how can you how can you help your parents in the best way? And what he said was, um, he made, he made this this comment, which it was it was a, a kind of a comment that you I'd never heard him say before, and I don't think he'd heard him say it bef- himself say it before. It just sort of popped out, <laughs> and he said, the kindest thing that you can do for your parents is not to create them. The kindest thing that you can do for your parents is not to create them. And uh, that, in a way, that little exchange exemplifies this whole area that I want to reflect on this afternoon. And uh, it was one of those comments also because it was uh, really out of nowhere. It was sort of un- unbidden and it appeared. But you immediately felt it was true. <laughs> you didn't know exactly what to do with it. But you, there was this immediate sense of, yes, that's right. Uh, and it was a bit startling for most of us because you thought that he would um, uh, come up with a, a list of different kinds of teachings you could give or <laughs> ways you could help around the house that would, uh, that would be more um, uh, acceptable or appealing. But that was his comment, that the kindest thing that you can do for your parents is not to create them. Now, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the word love tends to imply... A, uh, you know, a connection between you know, one person and, and other people. That's its, its implication. But in the, 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 the Buddhist context, um, uh, even though we just use you know, one word in English to, to, dis, to, to describe love, the, the, word, the English word, uh, I would say, uh, actually covers quite a wide range of different ways of relating. And so in, in the... Buddhist understanding of things, you basically have two different kinds of love. And so this is, uh, I thought, what it would be useful to share this afternoon. So the first kind of love is what we would, um, we, we normally think of as that kind of uh, affectionate relating between you and me. Um, and it's a kind of dearness, or in the, in the Pali language, it's called piyata, piyata. Uh, so dearness, fondness, uh, cherishing another person. So pieta, and so that that's the normal kind of, of everyday human uh, affection or friendship is uh, this this or pieta. And uh, and so we think, well, that's a normal good thing, good and wonderful thing to have in, in our lives. But um, the you know the Buddha pointed to this as, as something that it's uh, even though we think of of love of all kinds being something good and wonderful, uh, he pointed out that that kind of love, the, the love which is this kind of dearness or fondness or cherishing, uh, has its has its shadow as well. There's a, a couple of stories that uh, that are there in the script that you find in the scriptures where the, the Buddha outlines this quite uh, directly. And uh, the first one is from the, the uh, sutta in the, the middle length discourse is called the Pia Jataka Sutta, which means born from that which is dear. Pia Jataka, so born from that which is dear. And uh, it's a, it starts off with a scenario, the Buddha is, is meditating in the park, and this, uh, this man who's, uh, whose child, his son has just died, uh, is very distraught, very upset, very unhappy, 
and it comes to the Buddha and say, and um, he's you know flowing with uh, he's in floods of tears and he's uh, you know, unhappy and crying, and uh, he says to the Buddha, "I'm so unhappy. I'm very miserable because uh, my." Uh, <laughs> My uh, microphone is, <laughs> is continually dropping because my child has died. And the Buddha said, makes the comment, well, that's, that's the way it is. The, the ones that we love are the cause of suffering and pain to us. He said, no, that, that's completely wrong. You're the, well, the ones we love are the cause of, of happiness and joy. You don't know what you're talking about. And so even though he'd been in tears, he kind of didn't, <laughs> he didn't quite see the connection. And uh, he stomped off and disagreed with the Buddha when the Buddha said, yeah, the... Uh, the the ones we love are the or that we hold dear that we have that pieta for that uh, that's the cause of suffering in us. So he goes off and then uh, and a little distance away he finds a few guys who are drinking and, and playing dice with each other, gambling. And um, he says, I just met this stupid monk and uh, he said that the uh, the ones that are dear, those for whom we have uh, fondness, pieta, that they're the cause of, of suffering and pain and. And uh, that's totally stupid. Everyone knows that the, those that we have dearness, those who are dear to us, those that we have fondness for, are the source of, of joy and happiness. And the gamblers say, yeah, you're right. You're totally right. And that monk doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a fool. He's an idiot. So um, the, uh, the man agreed with the gamblers, and the gamblers agreed with the, the man. So uh, and the way of these things, this, this story of these exchanges then rattled around the uh, great city of Savati, and eventually ended up uh, reaching the, the palace, the story of this uh, encounter. And um, <clears throat> so the, this comes to Queen Malika and King Pasenadi. And uh, they, they hear the, of this story and uh, King Pasenadi says, well, uh, you know, I think in this case that the master, you know, the Buddha has, has got it wrong because everybody knows, it's common knowledge, everyone understands that those who are dear to us, the, those for whom we have you know, fondness, they are the source of happiness and joy in our lives. And then Queen Malika says, well, if the master said they're the source of suffering and pain, then that must be the case. And, uh, and then, of course, this leads to a little domestic dispute. And uh, Pasenadi says, I'll be off with you, Malika. Whatever the master says, you agree with him. You know, it's this, regardless of what he says, you always say, the master must be right. You know, away with you, get out of here. So there's a little a contretemps, <laughs> little uh, 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 domestic dispute between the two of them. And that, but they eventually say, well, you know, the master's going to be coming to, to visit. We've invited him uh, to come to the palace you know, soon. So when he comes, then we can ask him. As uh, Pasenadi says, well, I think he must have been wrongly reported. That, you know, maybe he is right, but he, 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 didn't, uh, he didn't really say that. You know, he, that, can't be what, uh, that can't be something he would have said. And so then when they meet the Buddha uh, a little while later, then uh, he, uh, he says, uh, the king asked him, so, uh, Venerable Sir, we heard this, this, this crazy story uh, last week, and in it uh, I was told that, that you said that um, those whom we hold dear, that we have this, uh, um, that are, for whom we have fondness, pieta, uh, they are the source of, that, that's the source of suffering and pain and sorrow for us. Uh, but that can't be true, can it? I mean, you wouldn't have said that. And he said, yes, I said that. <laughs> yes, uh, that they've, they've reported that correctly, and uh, it's true. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. And uh, so the, the king's kind of shocked. And uh, he said, well, how can that be? Everyone knows. Everybody knows uh, that uh, those uh, for whom uh, we have fondness, they, uh, that's the source of happiness and joy. And the Buddha said, well, so great king, is your daughter, the princess Vajiri, is she someone who's dear to you? Do you have fondness for her? He said, yes, of course. I'm, you know, I'm very, very fond of her. She's very dear to me. The dearest, dearest uh, being in the world. I love her very much. So, so if something un, something painful happened to her, if she got some horrible disease, if she was attacked, if she was injured, if she died, then how would you feel? Well, I'd be very upset. I'd be most distressed. It'd be really painful. Okay. So what about <laughs> what about Queen Malika? And then what about the Crown Prince? And what about the, the Chief Minister and the Junior Ministers? What about the the Kingdom of of, uh, of, uh, of Kosala, the city of Savati? And he goes through this long list of about fifteen different items uh, that uh, he. Uh, it says, if something happened to them, if they fell apart or they were injured or damaged, how would you feel? And, he go, and the Buddha is very, very thorough in these things, so he goes through one by one. And, uh, and sure enough, he, as he gets to the end, he, he realizes that over and over again he's saying, yes, 
if something uh, happened there, if, they, if those things fell apart, things were injured or damaged, yes, I feel pain and sorrow and unhappiness. And the Buddha said, well, that's exactly why I said <laughs> those things that, that we hold dear, that are for which we have uh, fondness, pieta, uh, that we hold to be dear, that the, uh, or piyati is the, the verb that we, we're holding as dear to us. Um, that's the, that, that very holding, that's the cause of sorrow and, uh, and pain and misery to us. So the queen was right and you were wrong. <laughs> and there's a, another exchange. It also takes place in Savati, where with, uh, this time with the great lay disciple Visaka. And um, she comes to the Buddha in the middle of the day and comes to the, the monastery of the Eastern Park. And uh, she's, her hair is all wet and her clothes are wet from just coming from a funeral ceremony. And the Buddha said, so, so what are you doing here in the middle of the day, Visaka? Your, your hair and your clothes are all wet. Yeah. You know, what, what's, uh, what have you been doing? What's, what's been happening? And you look very upset. And she said, well, I've just come from the funeral of my, my granddaughter, my dearest granddaughter. She's only five years old. And she just passed away. So um, uh, I was so upset and so uh, disturbed that uh, I, I wanted to come to the monastery because uh, um, you know, it was the only, pla only place I could think to come to to find a sense of solace or sanctuary. And uh, the Buddha then said, So, Visaka, yeah, I, uh, would you like to have as many children and grandchildren as there are uh, people in Savati? And she said, Oh, yes, and yes, indeed. And she already had about... Uh, according to legend, ten sons and ten daughters, and each of them had ten sons and ten daughters. So, by reputation, she had four hundred grandchildren. So, big family parties, and so she already had like twenty kids. So, uh, she said, "Yes, I'd like to have as many children as there are." And she was obviously a, a big-time family woman. And so, then the Buddha said, "Well, that's understandable, but um, yeah." So. Uh, how many people, Visaka, do you think die during a day in, in the kingdom, in the city of Savati? He said, well, at least ten people die every day, if not ten, nine, or if not nine, uh, eight, seven, six, five, you know, at least three or four people, at least a couple of people die every day in Savati. There's never a day in the city of Savati when somebody doesn't die. He said, well, if you had as many children and grandchildren as there are people in Savati, then would there ever be a day when your hair and your clothes weren't wet from coming from a funeral? QED, you know, and so she was very quick, she was much quicker on the uptake than King Pasena did, so she said immediately, okay, enough of so many children and grandchildren, you know, yeah, she got the point very, very quickly. So this, um, this, uh, this kind of, of love, uh, that kind of fondness, pieta, it's a, uh, what I would like to, I, I tend to call possessive love, and it's a, it's a, it's a uh, what you can also call a relationship of separateness. There's a me here and a you there. Maybe you could find the other microphone stand that we had last week. That, that one worked. This one doesn't work. Yeah. But if you don't mind. Thank you. So um, that, uh, that kind of uh, relationship, I would call a relationship of, of separateness. So that it's, there's a me here and a you there. And there's this sort of, <coughs> a, sort of a, dink, a distinct... Um, gap between us. So that as uh, a relationship based on self-view, on Sakaya Ditti, on that fixed idea of a, of a me here and a you there. I'm a separate, independent indiv individual and I'm apart from the rest of the world. So that, uh, as long as that, uh, that relationship is based on self-view, then it's, it cannot possibly be in, in tune with reality because you know, as you know, the Buddha pointed out, that quality of self-view uh, uh, and uh, that attachment to the feelings of I and me and mine, attachment to the body, to the personality, that, uh, that's the first obstruction to enlightenment. That's the, very, the first fetter, the first of the sangyojanas. And the, if, uh, if the mind can't get past that, then there's, there's no uh, possibility of enlightenment. So as long as our, our view of the world is based on me here and you out there, the world out there, as fixed and separate realities, then the result is always going to be painful. There's always going to be that uh, sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. That's, that's, uh, and that's what the Buddha's pointing to in this. So I would call that a relationship of, uh, of separateness. So uh, the other kind of love uh, is uh, also very familiar to us in, the, in Buddhist tradition, which is what we call metta, loving kindness. 
So this kind of loving is, is uh, very, very different, even though we use the same English word. Um, because uh, metta, loving kindness, is uh, intrinsically non-possessive. It's a, a love that's not dependent upon self-view. It's not dependent on a, a, a fixed idea of a me here and a you there. But uh, it's uh, what you can call liberative love. So that uh, it's the kind of love that, that lets go. And uh, <coughs> you know, along with the, um, there's the, the title of the talk uh, today, you know, if you truly love me, you would not create me in your mind. Um, there's also a, a Buddhist saying that uh, goes, um, uh, describing the, the enlightened ones, that, it, that uh, they so love the world that they have let go of it completely. So the, um, the, uh, the, to, to love the world doesn't mean to hang on to it, <laughs> or to possess it, or to own it, but to, to let go of it completely. And there's a, a passage in the, uh, the Sutta Nipata, verse um, 1098, which goes, See how letting go of the world is peacefulness. There is nothing that you need to hold on to, and there is nothing that you need to push away. So this, um, the the difference between um, metta and um, and pieta. Metta is a, a loving kindness, but it's a uh, so it's a uh, you can think of it more as a the natural disposition of the heart towards other uh, towards um, the other beings or, or towards the world towards all things when it's free of obscuration. So that's like the the uh, the natural um, relation, relationship between your, uh, the heart itself and then all experience is one of loving kindness or non-contention, non-aversion. Uh, the, um, the, the, one of the best ways to, to think of this, loving kindness is, uh, is still loving, but it's a love that's not dependent on getting anything back. It's not dependent on a feeling of self. It's not dependent on a, a sense of, of self and other. And so that uh, it's uh, in a more, uh, it's a, a kind of love that also involves a, a, a quality of letting go. As I said, you know, if you truly love the world, you let go of it completely. <laughs> and uh, this uh, title of the talk, uh, if, you, uh, if you truly love your parents, you won't create them in your mind. So what this is pointing to is that when I, I, uh, I think of, uh, 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 of other people, I tend to say, well, there's this... Um, there's Nick here in the front row, and there's, there's Wendy, just gave the name Kamiya to, and he's called Mungalo, is his Pali name. There's a sister Jin Ho, and uh, the, um, we have our names. And I can think of the uh, other monks and nuns here, or people in my family. And when we think of a name, then we remember the different exchanges that we've had, the history that we've had together, the, the, um, uh, the things that have been pleasant, the things that have been, un been unpleasant. And so uh, when the mind dwells upon those those characteristics, and uh, then we fix on that. Then that's what we call creating uh, somebody in their mind. So when when I create you in my mind, I'm, I just think of the memories that, that I have or the exchanges that we've had. Then when we meet, I don't really meet you. I meet my projections about you. I meet my memories. I meet my ideas, and so that um, I have, uh, in a way, uh, I'm only speaking to my projection. <laughs> Yeah, I create this mask for you, and then I talk to this mask. And then, meanwhile, you are doing the same thing for me. So you're talk, you're, you're, uh, you created a, your projections of me, and then you're talking to your projections of what, uh, Ajahn, what uh, you think Ajahn Amaro is, and what, he, what you think Ajahn Amaro thinks. And so you address your set of projections. And so you've got these two monologues kind of, <laughs> are kind of going past each other, is that, that we are... Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, just uh, relating to my projections about you, you're relating to your projections about me. So there isn't really any kind of communication. So when we have that relationship of separateness, then there's that, that non-communication, that, kind of, that kind of gap or that, that barrier between us. When there's a, a true loving kindness, then there's a letting go. Yeah? And the letting go is, also, is a letting go of self-view. It's a letting go of... A, fixed ideas about who and what I am. It's, in a way, it's the development of the insight into anatta, not self. So we are recognizing that my memories of you are just, uh, they're just mental formations. My ideas about you are just 
are just mental formations. So, if we want to establish metta, because sometimes when we, we, we read or study metta practice, it's, it's a kind of recitation of words, may I be happy, may all beings be happy, may my mother, my father, my children, my brothers, my sisters be happy, may all the other people in the monastery be happy, may the, all the rabbits and worms and blackbirds and you know, the, uh, the fishes in the pond around Amravati, may they all be happy. And we go through this long laundry list of beings. May all the people in Hemel Hempstead be happy, all the people in Berkhamstead be happy. <laughs> and, uh, and so it can still be, even though we're calling it meta, it can still be very much based on self-view. There's me here generating meta that I'm sending out there. But I would suggest that's a very superficial kind of, superficial kind of meta. Or, um, and that when meta is truly established in wisdom and in Dhamma, then it's not based upon that kind of uh, self-view. And a true meta, is, in a sense, is based on that letting go of of uh, the uh, the fixations of mind, so that when I, I, I see Nick conveniently here in the front row, Nick Pasika Mangalo, I say, well, I've got uh, I've got a set of impressions or ideas or memories about about him, but if I'm aware, oh, that's just my memories, or these are just my impressions, or this is my uh, ideas about him, or what he should or shouldn't be, or how he is or how he isn't, then if I recognise, well, those are just my thoughts. That's just my mind's creation of this this being as this and that's just my uh, my mental fabrications and i see that well, it's just a convenient fiction to call him nick or mongolo that's just a a, a handy a way of referring um, to a particular set of experiences then uh, if i so I'm, I'm in a way letting go of him i'm not creating him then that when we meet then i'm not talking to my projections i'm actually meeting <laughs> this uh, uh, and the, this other being, and then because I'm not creating projections to the, to the other, then that also helps the other not to create projections onto you. That's the way it seems to work. And so that then you actually have a, a, a communication, or what you would call a, as a, a, a true uh, connection, or you could, what you can call a relationship of, of wholeness. So these, uh, uh, that way of connecting or relating to others based on, on metta, uh, and uh, metta founded in wisdom, I, I use this this kind of terminology, a relationship of wholeness, because in essence, it's recognizing everything here is dhamma, everything in there, there, there is dhamma. Every, you know, we're all of, built of the same stuff. <laughs> we're all of the same fabric. So uh, rather than thinking there's a separate me here and a separate other there, they're recognizing that there's only this. <laughs> everything is dhamma, as Ajahn Chah put it. Inside is dhamma, outside is dhamma. Everything is dhamma. So that. Uh, in a way, away, through awakening to the reality of our own nature, then helps us to awaken to the reality of the nature of, of uh, everything. And so then that, that, in a way, it's not even a connection, because it's not two things separate that could be connected. <laughs> it's just, a, a, in a way, a, an awakening to there is just this. There is this reality. There is the, 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 this um, uh, immanent quality of this present moment. And it involves these, uh, these particular aspects, these particular attributes we call me and you, and, and this uh, Dhamma talk in the sala at uh, Amravati on uh, Sunday, the after, uh, Sunday the 10th of, of August. But we recognize these are just convenient fictions. It's just a, uh, an easy way of talking about the present experience. It's just a handle to put up upon it. We, we don't have to call it the 10th of August. We could, you know, the government could, uh, uh, could decide, okay, we, we're going to make a change in the calendar, and we're going to shift everything forward one week. <laughs> And so, you know, they could just decide, okay, tomorrow it won't be the 11th of August, it'll be the 17th. They've done it before, <laughs> back uh, a few centuries ago, just uh, decided to miss a week so that the, uh, the calendar would, would line up in a desired way once again. So we give, we give names to each other, we give names to the days of the week. Uh, today is the full moon, so on, according to the lunar calendar, today is, a, is a, a Sabbath day as well, so it happens to be the seven-day week and the... And the lunar, uh, the lunar cycle lines up today, but usually it doesn't. But the, at the, this particular time, it does. So when we see our, uh, the way that we create each other, our judgments of like, I like this person, I don't like that person, this person is inspiring, this person is really difficult, um, then we see, oh, that's just my memories, that's just my mind's creations. And particularly with family relations, or you know, your work partners, or your ex-partners, <laughs> That uh, 
there can be a lot of density and difficulty. We can carry stories uh, very easily around in our mind. You know, that oftentimes when you're doing metta practice and and uh, you know you're encouraged to have loving kindness for all beings, and that uh, there can be a few on our list that you say, well, may all beings be happy except her. You know, <laughs> that uh, you know someone who's done you wrong, or that uh, uh, you uh, you just can't arouse those, those uh, positive feelings for. But when we see that those sort of the stories that we have, the memories, the designations that we create, these are are convenient fictions. They're they're things designated into being. They're they're brought into being and, and established by our thoughts. Then we recognize, oh well, they can be they can be um, di- they can be seen through. They, they, they if they have been established, we can unestablish them. We can free ourselves from them. We don't have to be defined or confined by those definitions. So that's, in a way, seeing how we create each other. Seeing, in the course of a day, how often we create our children, our parents, our siblings, our loved ones, you know, the people that we live with, the people that we're responsible for. And the, the first step is to, to see how we create them. <laughs> and then to, to see if we can learn how to not create them. And when we manage to, to let go, we see that those kind of judgments are, are simply convenient fictions. And then and there is, in a way, relating to others on the basis of a heart that's, that's let go, the heart that is free of clinging, then we, is, we experience a genuine quality of metta. There's a real, uh, a genuine love, a, a love that does not needing anything, a love that's not holding on to anything, a love that doesn't depend on, on anything or any kind of particular feedback or result or, or um, you getting anything from that, that connection. It's just a natural way of relating to, to the world. There's another simple way of um, describing this that I quite like. I was at a, a wedding. Ble- I've often mentioned this, but I thought it was a very, very neat and succinct way of talking about this distinction. It was a, at a wedding blessing that a monk was doing for a, a newly married couple. And he, uh, <coughs> he said, yeah, if there's the two of you, you, know, you love each other very much. He could tell that the couple were kind of all eyes for each other and very besotted and devoted. He said, now, if you spend all your time looking at each other, uh, it's understandable, you know, you just married, so you, you love each other very much. But if you spend your whole time looking at each other, then he's going to think it's his job to make her happy. She's going to think it's her job to make him happy. And then if, you're not, and then if she's not happy, then he's going to think, I'm not doing my job. I sh- it's my, she's not happy and I'm, I'm, I'm failing, so I've got to try harder to make her happy. And if she, if she sees he's not happy, then she thinks, oh, he's not happy, it's my fault. I've got to try harder to make him happy. And, uh, <clears throat> or it might be that I'm not happy and it's her fault. <laughs> it's her job to make me happy and I'm not happy, so she's failing. She might be thinking the same. But I'm not happy and he should be making me happy and it's his job to, to do that, so he's failing me. And so that if you spend all your time looking at each other, then you're only going to end up in conflict. It's going to be difficult because you can never find uh, a true uh, completion, a true contentment, a true satisfaction, just looking at each other and asking so much of each other all the time. But instead, rather than making your marriage around looking at each other all the time, if you're instead side by side looking at that which is beyond both of you, then your relationship can really work. And kind of Okay, we're good. We're good. So that, you know, looking... You know, side by side, you know, beyond. And so I feel that's, <coughs> the, uh, that's exactly what I mean by a relationship of wholeness, is that you use your connection with each other to look beyond uh, what, uh, uh, what you are as personalities, to look beneath the layer of the, the, the personality. And it's also very interesting, uh, a fact of the English language that I like to mention very often is that the word person comes from the, from the Latin word persona, which means a mask. Per means through, sona means sound. So that when the actors in the, the Greek and Roman theater, they, they'd all wear masks. So that the voice you'd speak, the actor would speak through the mask. So that the persona is that which the sound goes through. So your persona is a mask. So that's a kind of a clue, <laughs> a big clue. And so that with, with uh, this uh, way of, of uh, developing love for each other, and love for the world, it's uh, looking beneath the mask, uh, get, getting beyond the personality, so letting go of self-view and self-obsession. 
And then you find a quality uh, of connectedness and a quality of communion that is is uh, uh, is uh, uh, incomparable. Oh, it's also, it's not just within family relationships or marriages and partnerships, but also within the monastery, because it can be uh, that you know, the um, <laughs> you still have these. Uh, it's still possible to have a relationship of separateness in a monastery. You know, you're looking up to the teacher and thinking, oh, the you know, teacher is so wonderful or so special, or looking at other people and thinking, oh, you know, she's so inspiring or he's so awful, or you know, or the looking down at <laughs> the teachers or looking at the others and saying, oh. These are my students, and and uh, you know I'm a uh, a useless teacher because the, the students are not behaving right, or they don't they don't really like me very much, or I'm a wonderful teacher because they're always praising me, and I've got you know, gazillions of people on my uh, who have friended me on Facebook, or, or you know who have uh, just somebody sent me a a a, a, a link to a um a, a Goodreads website saying, have you seen this, Ajahn? Have people been Rating your books on Goodreads, you know, to see uh, how you know what kind of a how many stars have I got on Goodreads? You can find out for yourself. <laughs> and so that yeah, we can we can still, even though we are kind of, we're spiritual professionals, we can still get stuck in those kind of um, separative ways. But it was it was very interesting living with, with Lumpur Cha because he was an extremely uh, magnetic character. He was very powerful um, presence, and he was greatly revered. But he never ever fed that that kind of adulation when people were sort of looking up to him and adoring him. If you got too gushy or too devotional, he would send you off to some really ghastly branch monastery. You know that you'd be exiled to Suen Kloi for you know at least six months or a year to kind of cool off. Um, and so he wasn't looking for people to sort of adore him or to to look at him as the one and only or the sort of super guru, uh, he was happy to be the teacher and to, to guide and to be the central figure, but he he wouldn't let it get personal. Or if people were trying to sort of get specially close relationships with him or to, to be seen as being special, like, you know, I'm your, I'm your kind of super disciple, aren't I, Lumpur? You know, we wouldn't put it in quite those ways, but you know, <laughs> roundabout ways, like, well, you, you know I'm special, don't you, Lumpur? You know, but... Uh, and uh, you know, if you try that, you'd be off to Suen Goy for like three years, you know, <laughs> because uh, he just he wouldn't uh, feed that. He didn't need that in himself. He didn't need to be loved. He didn't need to have that kind of stroking, as it were, social stroking. Uh, he, uh, but he saw that the connection between the teacher and the student was a very fertile ground. That, that yes, so, uh, it's. Uh, people want to want to learn, and there's people who can teach who have abilities, but uh, yet you can create, you, you can use that dynamic of a teacher and a student, and yet not make it personal, not have it built on self view about, look at me, I'm the great teacher, or I could be, I want to be the great teacher, or uh, I'm the perfect disciple, I'm a useless disciple, but uh, he had an extraordinary ability to to not feed that. So that people, you found it, and like I was saying, if you drop your projections of others, then others find it easier to drop their projections about you. So similarly, when you knew that Ajahn Chah didn't, wasn't projecting anything onto you, you, you know, he didn't need, any, he didn't need anything from you. He wasn't looking for um, a particular um, way of you sort of loving him or adoring him or expressing your gratitude or appreciation or whatever. Um, then you were able to let go of those of compulsions in yourself. You were able to just relax and to not feel you had to be something in order to please the Ajahn. And that you could just be more yourself. And then when you were just completely yourself <laughs> in, uh, in that particular time and just sort of relaxed and you know, ordinary and natural and straightforward, then you could see he really would light up. It's like, oh good, <laughs> you, you're getting over that, that Compulsion to try and be someone, or be special, or be uh, 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 so sort of fix fixing your way in a in a particular fashion. So this uh, the kind of methods that we uh, can use to help support this is uh, essentially just uh, an ongoing watchfulness, just looking how at how our mind works, moment by moment, day by day, seeing how we create others, and seeing how. When we when we recognize that we're doing that, to to see okay now, <laughs> I've just created uh, my brother or my sister. I'm just just created um, 
my boss or that uh, or that person at the traffic light you know? <laughs> you know, I just created them as being like that and and seeing that the mind is is judging and is fixing somebody in that way to just ask yourself now see if I can not do that can I let go of that person can I let go of that uh, as being a, a fixed and uh, definite reality and so then that uh, that letting go that relaxation then we if we are able to apply that in that moment judging you know, the person who's just uh, snuck ahead of you at the traffic light like <laughs> making some kind of uh, what who's that idiot I think he is and how dare he and and just to say well wait a minute you know maybe they just saw a gap in the traffic and they moved into it maybe they're not a total idiot maybe they're not just uh, trying to be impolite and uh, and selfish yeah, maybe uh, I'm just leaping to conclusions here. Maybe, or maybe they're in a hurry. Maybe they've got some very important event to get to. Their, you know, daughter's wedding, or, <laughs> or they've got to go and perform surgery on somebody. Yeah. But the, and then you, you know, you you see your judgments. You 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 learn to look at it, reflect on it, tweak it, and then you, uh, in seeing that, then you you recognize, oh look, what it's like when you don't depend on those kind of judgments. When you when you drop that that uh, habit of creating others, just notice what that feels like inside. When you let go of your preconceptions, just see. Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> Suddenly, the world got a bit more spacious. The world got a bit more peaceful. There's a bit more room in life. And so, the more that we're able to see, that's what uh, that's what happens when we let go of others. Then, the more we are encouraged to do that. And the mysterious thing is that that uh, rather than that making that letting go of self view and letting go of, of uh, that self centered thinking, rather than it making us less caring <laughs> and less affecting, less effective at helping others or being attentive or useful, because it might sound like well, we're supposed to just sort of think about anatta and just <laughs> cut ourselves off from the, the family and not really, you know, you're just a set of sankharas arising and passing away, mum, you know. <laughs> You know, I'm letting I'm letting you go. I'm not creating you, Mum. You know, like and so you're not trying to turn ourselves into a bunch of uh, of sort of zombies, uh, registering data, you know, arising and passing away. But if we we practice with this, if there's metta genuinely based on a real organic wisdom, then you find you're able to help in much more effective ways. <laughs> you're able to to uh, lend a hand when it's really needed, and you're able to keep quiet when it's needed. You're not a compulsive helper, <laughs> uh, and that. When it's time to leave things alone, you can leave them alone. When it's time to jump in and, and say something and do something, you can you can step in and, and do something. And that um, you you also have the confidence that uh, you not doing something or not saying something is not because you don't care, but it's in this moment nothing can be said. In this moment, there's nothing to be done. So the kindest thing to do is leave it alone. And then maybe ten seconds later, okay, now <laughs> now's the moment to step in. But that. Uh, the more that we let go of self-view, uh, the more we let go of creating ourselves and creating others, then the more we are able to to be really tuned in to the time, the place, the situation, and we can respond in a in a mindful way. Now it can be also it can be a little bit um, uh, confusing, you know, because some you know we can uh, when we hear these these sort of teachings. Uh, just as I was describing, we can, we can handle it in the wrong way, so that we can think, well, am I supposed to let go and be totally detached? Or am I supposed to be totally attentive and um, and involved with everything? You know, is it supposed to be, you know, are we supposed to be attending to every detail, or are we supposed to be totally detached? Uh, and in this respect, uh, there is a very, another very helpful teaching that Lumpo Cha gave that um, uh, is often spoken about was uh, when uh, uh, Ajahn Sumedha was a young monk and had been at Ajahn Chah's monastery for, for two or three years. One day Ajahn Chah said to him, Sumedho, Islampo, you must find it very confusing. And he said, why is that? Yeah, what's he talking about? <laughs> you, must, you must find it very confusing because the Dhamma teaching is all about letting go, right? It's like, don't attach to anything, don't cling to anything, everything is empty, uh, let go, let go, let go. 
And yet the Vinaya teaching, the teaching of the monastic discipline is pay attention to every single detail, don't do anything wrong, you've got the, all these you know, thousands of rules that you've got to keep and they all got to be kept very, very precisely and everything matters. Uh, so the Vinaya is telling you, hold on, hold on, you know, take a, you know, keep a firm grip on, on everything, you know, pay attention to everything. So you must find that confusing, right? And he said, yes, actually, I do. <laughs> and at that moment, he thought, okay, now Lumpur is going to explain to me you know, how, it, how it can be that the Dhamma is all about letting go and the Vinaya is all about holding on. And then, so he's sort of you know, waiting for the punchline and, and all Lumpur Chah said to him was, well, when you figure out how they work together, you'll be fine. <laughs> which was not much consolation, but it was also, it was a helpful teaching because in a sense, you, you, can't, you can't really write a formula for that. You just have to learn how to get the feeling for it. And that they, uh, it's, in, the, in the scriptures, the Buddha always talks about his own teaching as the Dhamma Vinaya, the, 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 the Dhamma teachings and then the, the discipline. So not just wisdom, but also sila, that there's not just the the, um, the the wisdom teachings that you know, everything is empty and uh, nothing belongs to us, uh, but <clears throat> and you know, that all dhammas are not self, but also that we should pay attention to every single action, every single word, every every moment. We need to pay very very uh, be carefully attuned to you know, all situations in order to be honest, to be harmless, to be respectful, to be wise, and to uh, have the the, you know, the right word and action for the time, the place, the situation. So that uh, <clears throat> that um, blending of the two uh, is, 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 in a way, that's the flavor of Buddha Dhamma. So the, the Dhamma, it's not just Dhamma, it's Dhamma Vinaya, that the, the two go together. And that uh, our, <clears throat> uh, and our task, in some respects, and the way to develop this, uh, what, we, what I've been talking about is a relationship of wholeness and, and way of relating to uh, the world and to each other on a basis of wholeness, is finding that that balance, that, that what is essentially the middle way, where everything matters and nothing matters, <laughs> where it, like uh, also being around Ajahn Chah, even though I couldn't understand Thai at all, you could just seeing the way that he operated, and that related to people, you could see yeah, here uh, here is somebody who uh, is is not hanging on to anything. Yeah, he's is of someone who's completely let go of everything, um, and yet he wasn't like a slob or kind of <laughs> or out of control or just sort of acting in in a, 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 you know unpredictable or crazy ways. His conduct was extremely precise and very careful. He kept the rules very very strictly, um, and so he was someone who didn't need anything, who was not hanging on to anything, who didn't have to prove anything, but yet. Yeah, he was. You know, when you put your 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 shoulder bag down, you put it down in a very precise way. When you you get up and you you walk across the room, you walk in a very careful way. When when you <laughs> you um, he, uh, he used to have false teeth. You know, when you <laughs> when you change your false teeth, you're very careful about where you put down the the previous set of teeth, and then you pick up the new ones. And you have a particular procedure that you use every time. So he was very mindful and careful of every detail. But yet there was there was nobody there and nobody hanging on to anything, and so I remember thinking, uh, and I often talk about this because it was had such an Im impact on me that even though I couldn't really understand Thai, I had this feeling of if I, if, it do, if I can get to be like that, even if it takes forty years, I don't care. <laughs> Whatever it takes to get where he is, I'll do it, <laughs> because that there was a sense of that that's how we can really perfect the human life. It's not a matter of freedom through defying conventions or just sort of following your own impulses and desires. And it's not a matter of just behaving in a very sort of controlled or, or, or precise or careful way or having everything you know, perfectly orderly. That, that it was this extraordinary balance of both uh, a complete non-attachment but also a complete involvement that was, uh, was really powerful. And in later years, then I discovered that, um, that the the word that the Buddha used to refer to himself, Tathagata, uh, it's a, it seems to be a deliberately ambiguous word. And uh, there's a, a, a there's a wonderful section in one of D.T. Suzuki's books where he says the word Tathagata is is impossible to translate. 
There's no way you can render that into any, uh, in, in any language. You can't explain what it means. And then spends 14 pages explaining what it means. <laughs> but it's, very, it's a very interesting word to reflect upon because it's, it's made of two parts. So the first part, tat, T-A-T-H, like the English word that. Yeah, T-A-T-H, tat, uh, means thus or such. And then the second part uh, is, uh, is has the word gata, tathagata. So, and then gata is like the word gachami, like buddhang saranang gachami, I go to the refuge. I go for, to the Buddha for refuge. So gata is from the verb gachami, I go. But uh, the way you make a negative in Pali is to have an A on the front. So the debate for the last two and a half thousand years has been, is it tathagata, meaning one who has come to suchness, or is it tata gata, one who has gone to suchness? So is the Buddha totally here, or is he totally gone? Is he completely transcendent? Is, is thus gone, completely gone to suchness, has, uh, has um, let go of everything, or is he totally imminent, totally present, come to suchness, utterly here, present, uh, attuned to the here and now? Well, the Buddha really liked word plays, there's a lot of puns and word plays throughout the, the Pali teachings. And so my suspicion is that he coined this word deliberately to have two meanings. It, it's supposed to mean both completely here and completely gone. And that, in a, in a sense, perfectly describes the nature of the Buddha. Is Yes, when the Buddha was uh, alive, he was uh, a totally physical body. He ate food, he breathed air, he walked on the ground. Um, but every act, but then totally gone in terms of he was not attached or, or, or clinging to anything. He wasn't identified with his body, with his personality, with the people that he was with or the, the landscape he was in. He was, uh, there was no entanglement, no confusion, no confinement because of the situation. And every word that he spoke from the time of enlightenment to the Parinibbana was, uh, as they say, was perfectly attuned to the, every situation, to every, uh, the needs of every individual he was with whether they could appreciate his words or not. <laughs> uh, every action was perfectly harmless, was perfectly uh, appropriate to time and place. So that uh, right there in the Buddha's life, you have these qual this mixture of both fully present and attentive to every detail and fully detached and, and transcendent. And, um, and so that uh, this is described in one of the qualities of the Buddha, vijja charana sampano, which means... Uh, perfectly accomplished in knowledge and conduct. Vija means awareness or knowing, knowledge, uh, so that uh, the Buddha perfect in, in knowledge, so completely awake and transcendent, uh, and then uh, and also uh, perfect in conduct, the charana, the activity. So his, he, uh, <coughs> there was also that perfect attunement and refinement of conduct. And the two are a pair. You can't really get the conduct without the vijja or the, <laughs> or the you know, without the, the, the wisdom, and you can't get the wisdom without the conduct. The two, the two are perfectly fused. They, they work perfectly together. And that, the middle way, which is an extremely simple term, <laughs> I would say that is exactly describing that um, mysterious and, and uh, compelling mixture of both uh, fully present and fully transcendent, both uh, completely attuned and uh, and uh, and uh, unidentified. That has love for all beings, but knows that uh, there are no beings. And uh, I thought I'd finish with a there's a, uh, a sutra from the the northern Buddhist tradition called the the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, and uh, it's it's full of these kind of passages. Um, and so some people find this very frustrating or irritating, but I think it's a, it's a very helpful teaching in some respects. And it's a dialogue between a monk called Subhuti and the Buddha. And the Buddha's talking to the Subhuti, and he says, Subhuti, what do you think? You should not maintain that the Tathagata, the Buddha, has this thought. I shall take living beings across to enlightenment. Subhuti, do not have that thought. And why? There are actually no living beings taken across to enlightenment by the Tathagata. If there were living beings taken across by the Tathagata, then the Tathagata would have the existence of a self, of others, of living beings, and a life, like he would believe in self and other, he would still be stuck on atta, on the self-view. 
Sabuti, the existence of a self spoken of by the Tathagata is no existence of self, but common people take it as the existence of a self. Sabuti, common people are spoken of by the Tathagata as no common people, therefore they are called common people. And over and over and over again, those people who are familiar from the northern tradition would be familiar with this, this sutra. It says, um, living beings, living beings, why are they called living beings? They're called living beings because there are no living beings. That's why they're called living beings. You know. Carrying, you know, a bodhisattva cannot carry, carry living beings across because there is no bodhisattva and no living beings. That's why we say the bodhisattva carries living beings across. <laughs> like, and it's, it's deliberately ambiguous. Like, it takes you to this sort of, huh? Like, well, either there is a living being or there isn't a living being. You know, either something is, someone, is a being who's ignorant and needs to be carried across to enlightenment, or there is not. You know, you, um, and uh, so the rational mind gets very annoyed <laughs> with this, this kind of uh, sort of confusing and ambiguous northern Buddhist Mahayana type statements. But you find a few of them in the Theravada canon as well. But I feel it expresses those things those very well. It's like Ajahn Chah talking about um, Dhamma and Vinaya. And maybe the last story to, to share with you is um, this took place at a, uh, a Buddhist conference in Germany a number of years ago. And there was this, uh, there was this uh, Tibetan Lama who was teaching at the conference. And the, along with the main discussions of the conference, they had little kind of side rooms and activities. And uh, there was this group of students with this, with this Lama who had, uh, had this opportunity to receive teachings from him and to spend time with him while the conference was going on. And so uh, during this, the course of this, one of the, the German students um, said, uh, not to typecast Germans as, as a you know, sort of obsessive rationalist, but this was a rather rationalist student. <laughs> so he said, Rinpoche, Rinpoche, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm very devoted to your teachings, and I, I'm, I'm very happy to commit myself to the path, but you'll be doing all these practices, the visualizations of the 21 Taras, and listening to these teachings about the wisdom of Tara, and, and yeah, Tara is supposed to be this Bodhisattva, this kind of female Buddha uh, incarnation of active wisdom, but I've got this stumbling block, because I don't know whether Tara really exists. So if she really exists, then I can devote myself to the practice completely and fully, and I really give myself to it. And, but if she doesn't exist, then I, you know, I can't really take it seriously because she's not there. Uh, and so we're just sort of talking into empty space. So please, Rinpoche, once and for all, tell me, Taha, does she exist or does she not? And so then the Rinpoche kind of closed his eyes and thought for a moment. She knows that she's not real. And, that, and the answer was to that was silence. <laughs> or the response to that was, was silence. So, so anyway, I'll leave it there. I noticed the, the, um, the sound of cups and people appearing from the kitchen signals that it's time for some tea and refreshments. So we'll, we'll break for 20 minutes and then uh, come back together for some questions and dialogue at uh, 20 past three. <laughs>